In this class, we're going to talk about how voice acoustics are affected by factors like sex and gender. Now just to start, it's worth pointing out that sex and gender have different meanings, and the typical, very brief definition of the distinction between these is that sex is biological while gender is socially or culturally determined. And that's a pretty good place to start. Uh, there's a lot more complication behind this than what you just see on the screen. Um, but this is a pretty good starting point for us to talk about how it affects voice. Another good place to start is just with the physical differences between women and men. And the word sexual dimorphism just refers to the fact that there are generally two shapes. And we're talking about shapes of vocal tracts here. So in general, um, we can think of women as being just slightly um, smaller than men. And so therefore, as we're thinking about the resonant properties of the vocal tract, we should expect that difference in size to correspond to a difference in resonant frequency, or in our case, formant frequencies. One of the most interesting things you'll find is that not all the acoustic differences between women and men are explained just by anatomical differences. So for example, if you look at the differences in resonant frequencies, they're disproportionately larger than the corresponding differences in actual vocal tract size. Alternatively, those differences in, in voice resonances are just not correlated in a systematic way with actual differences between people's sizes. So one of the stories that we're going to be building throughout this class is pointing out how there are a lot of ways in which women and men express their gender through their voice acoustics in ways that are not just tied to their physical biology, but are rather arbitrary or culturally learned. So for example, a child picking up a pattern of speech by hanging out with an, an older woman, a mom, a sister, an aunt, or a friend. So we want to base our discussion based on the framework that we've used so far in this class, specifically the source filter model of speech production. So let's start with the source. The source spectrum, shown here in this blue box, is generated at the glottis, or basically where the vocal folds are, for voice sounds, and then it's eventually filtered by the vocal tract. But let's, let's think about what goes on at the source and whether that has any impact from sex or gender. We can observe physically that the vocal folds of women are smaller and lighter than those of men, so you can expect them to vibrate at a faster rate. And this is the thing that is probably most familiar to us when we're thinking about the differences between women and men's voices, is that women tend to have a higher pitch. And this is really partially due to these differences in vocal fold size, which is really about a 50 to 60% difference. The way we can measure this on a spectrum, for example, is by looking at the placement of the harmonic frequencies. So up top here, we can see the spacing between the harmonics for a woman's voice. And then on the bottom, we have a man's voice where the harmonics are spaced more closely together. And the reason for this is that they're all multiples of a lower starting number. So on the bottom, we have multiples of the number 120. So we have 120, 240, 360, 480, and so on. But up top for the woman's voice, this is 200 Hertz. So we go 200, 400, 600, 800, etc. So they're farther spaced apart because they're multiples of a higher starting number or higher fundamental frequency. So these differences in fundamental frequency are of course pretty reliable between uh, adult women and adult men, but as it turns out, they're not the same across all cultures. So we'll touch back on that later, but just keep in mind that we're trying to eventually separate the physical contributions from the social or cultural contributions. Another topic to talk about when we think about the spectrum is what actually happens at the glottal source. So not just the rate of vibration, but what's going on during that pitch period. So what I want to demonstrate on this slide is the glottal open quotient. What this means is, as you think about the repeating element, that repetition of that pitch period, think about what the vocal folds are doing. Part of the time they're open, part of the time they're closed. And what we want to think about here is what proportion of that time are they open versus closed. So we can divide this sound here into three chunks. We can see three pitch periods there. And imagine for part of that chunk, the vocal folds are closed, and for part of it, they're open. Of course, they have to alternate between being closed and open to create this periodic pattern. So in this case, the glottal airflow, of course, is going to be higher when the vocal folds are open, and that pattern is going to repeat for every pitch period. 
So what we're looking at here is a basically 50-50 split. So if during that pitch period, the vocal folds spend about as the same amount of time closed as open, this corresponds to what we call modal voicing. And this is the standard kind of voicing, and it's the kind of voicing I'm using right now. And there are two other kinds of voicing that we'll talk about. Up top, what we see is that for a majority of the pitch period, the vocal folds are open, which means that more air is coming out. And what we, what we call this is breathy voice, or at least we call the corresponding sound breathy voice. And we'll have some examples of this in just a moment. The opposite of this is when you have a majority of that pitch period spent actually closing the vocal folds. So what we see on this, on these lines, we have green for creaky, we have the maroon line for modal, and we have a blue one for breathy. And what we're seeing is just a different proportion of that time when we're just allowing the airflow to go through. We're going to talk a lot more about creaky voice later, but at the point where we're at in the discussion right now, what we want to do is concentrate on the physical differences and what their consequences would be for the sound of the voice. So for example, if women have th thinner vocal folds, they might be less likely to achieve complete closure during that pitch period when phonating sounds, and therefore produce a breathier voice quality. So the two things we've talked about so far are the fundamental frequency, or the pitch, down by the source spectrum, and then the voice quality corresponding to the proportion of glottal airflow that occurs during each pitch period. So now we can move on to the output spectrum as it's affected by the filter. As we mentioned before, vocal tracts in women tend to be a little bit smaller than those in men, and so therefore you'd expect, with any smaller resonating chamber, higher formant frequencies. So the filter part of the source and filter model is the product of the shape and size of the vocal tract. So that's what we'll explore now. When we think about sex-related differences in the filter, we're thinking about differences in the formant frequencies that scale inversely with the size of the talker. So for example, if we have this ooh vowel spoken by a woman, and we imagine the same vowel spoken by a man, you'd expect, if the man were bigger, for all of those formant frequencies to be scaled down. And that's what we see. Conversely, if you have a, a, a vowel spoken by a man, let's say this E, and then expect a woman to produce the same sound, you'd expect those frequencies to scale up. So these are just, you know, one vowel at a time compared side by side. We can also look at the whole vowel space. For example, here we have the different vowels in English, and these are the formant frequencies spoken by an adult woman in Michigan, which explains why that a vowel is pushed so far up, if you remember from the last class on dialects. So if we overlay the vowel positions for a man's voice, here's what we have here. So notice how the formant frequencies for the man are just lower in both the F1 and the F2 dimension, and we can point out the differences between corresponding vowels here. And you'll notice that the differences in the front vowels are a little bit more pronounced than the corresponding differences in back vowels. And there could be multiple reasons for this. One is that front vowels might be where gender is expressed a little bit more than in back vowels. Another reason could be that if you view this on a logarithmic scale, the higher frequencies should require more of a difference in order to tell them apart. There are some complications when thinking about vocal tract size and how it differs between women and men. For example, the relationship between actual vocal tract size and corresponding formant frequencies seems to be more consistent in women than it is in men, which means that you can measure the formant frequencies of women and have a pretty good estimate of how large they are, but if you do that for men, you might get the wrong answer. So you might conclude from this that men are doing something to disguise their true vocal tract size, possibly to mask their true body size. And this has actually been observed already in elsewhere in the animal kingdom. For example, red deer and baboons seem to make judgments about whether, um, whether something is potentially a predator based on their perception of vocal tract size. So you can imagine it could be a tool that they can use also to express dominance or to express, you know, some vocal cue that you're a larger or more suitable or more attractive mate. 
Another thing you'll notice is that you can just imitate differences in vocal tract size. For example, if you're just, you know, mimicking a conversation between a woman and a man, you can go, she said, blah, 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 and he said, blah, 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 blah. and then she said, blah, 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 and then he said, blah, 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 blah. so that was all for my voice. And of course, it's like totally ridiculous, but we have all done this before, right? So you can imagine that if you're trying to imitate someone else, and they have a different vocal tract size than you, you have a little bit of flexibility when you're trying to imitate that. So we've been talking primarily about vowels and formant frequencies so far, but there are ways that gender is expressed in consonants as well. So for example, if you take the consonants sh and s, you, you expect that these have different frequencies because they differ by place of articulation. So on this little cartoon spectrum here, we have a high frequency bit of energy for s and a lower bit frequency for sh, and this would correspond, for example, to a woman's voice. So we have Ashley pronouncing the sh and s sounds, and the boundary between them would be would fall somewhere along that frequency uh, axis. But if we had Pavel uh, pronounce these sounds, right, his voice is coming from a larger vocal tract, and so we'd expect all those frequencies to be shifted down, and so the boundary between his phonemes would be at a lower frequency point. So an interesting thing about this is that if you set up these sounds in a listening experiment, and you just gradually change the sounds from the lowest to the highest points on this diagram, the listeners will actually categorize the sound based on who they think is speaking it, rather than just the acoustics. So we both produce this difference, and we're sensitive to it when we're listening to sounds. As you might imagine, we're starting to think about the aspects of sound that are not necessarily controlled just by the physical anatomical differences, but also by our experience and our expression of our own gender. In a really interesting study done in 2001 by Perry and other colleagues, they found that the differences between voice pitch started to emerge well be before puberty, which is to say well before there's any anatomical differentiation between vocal tracts between boys and girls. So even children as young as four years old started to map their vocal patterns more like their corresponding gender counterparts in adults. So for example, girls started a pattern like women, and boys started a pattern like men. Another really interesting study looked at speech patterns in Glaswegian English and they had an interesting subset of listeners, or talkers in this case, from different backgrounds. They had boys, girls, men, and women, and they also split them by different kinds of socioeconomic status. So for example, they found that girls from working class backgrounds, as opposed to middle class backgrounds, would map their S pronunciation in a way that's pretty similar to their male peers. So in, in, in other words, girls sounded more like boys. But among the middle class, um, which what they they would sort of correspond to be like the more affluent group in this in this uh, sample here, the girls pattern less like boys and more like women. So there was a little bit of a social difference, depending on what circle you ran in, um, there was a difference in how you expressed your gender through your speech. So people have interpreted this and, and commented that maybe there are differences based on um, traditions and whether uh, communities that are more conservative might have more of a fixed way that they might see how gender should be expressed. But in other areas, such as, you know, urban areas, there might be more free range for variation outside of those conventional norms. So this might be true, it might not be true. It's really more part of an ongoing discussion right now. But the measurements that we've talked about so far overall imply that some of the gender-related acoustic variation is under individual's control and reflects not just anatomical or biological differences, but cultural and individual ones as well. The differentiation of gender turns out to be different in different cultures. So what we have here on this graph are three colors corresponding to the quantiles of pitch range, and what that means is, on the lower left, what we have are the lowest frequencies, the lowest pitches among men, and then up here we have the highest pitches among men, and then the lines above that are the corresponding measurements for women. So we can see that there's a very stark difference between women and men, but what we see is that the blue lines are closer to each other, and if you look at the F and M in blue, the black lines are a little bit farther apart, and the 
the red lines are even farther than that. So the red lines are for um, F0 measurements made in Japanese talkers, the black are German talkers, and the blue are speakers of English. So it seems that there's a language-specific pattern that determines how much differentiation there is between fundamental frequencies of women and men. So on this blog post by Mark Liberman, which you can look up um, using the links at the end of this talk, um, you'll find a lot of comments. So for example, there's this trilingual speaker who made uh, a comment just pointing out how when she speaks in different language, she even knows that, you know, she's speaking with a different pitch. And when she speaks Polish, that her pitch is lower than when, it, when she speaks English. So we have some anecdotal and some objective measurements demonstrating that the inherent fundamental frequency difference between people who identify as women or as men can change depending on what language they are speaking. So there seem to be some cross-language differences in vowel space as well. So we have differences in fundamental frequency as well as vowel space, both of the, you know, the source and the filter components that we've talked about. And even the differences in vowel space don't appear to be related to cross-cultural differences in average height. So for example, if you have people from one part of the globe that te just tend to be a lot larger than in another, another part of the world, um, those differences don't appear to explain all the variability in vowel space. There seems to be something that's intentionally controlled. There are also differences in terms of how we view these voice acoustics in terms of their impact on attractiveness. So for example, in a study done with speakers of Japanese and Dutch, the impact of raising the F0 of a man's voice had a big impact on the perception of whether that man was attractive or not for Japanese listeners, whereas for Dutch listeners, it didn't really have that much of an effect. So when we think about these kinds of experiments, one of the things that should come to mind is how would you create these different kinds of sounds for people to listen to? Here's an example of the output of a sound manipulation process we can do in Prot, where we can just run a, a function that's called change gender. Now what it does is it scales the spectrum in a way that you see here, you can see the formant frequencies going from higher on the left and then to a middle range and then lower on the right, as well as a change in the fundamental frequency. So here, let's listen to what these sound like. First I'll play the one in the middle, since this was, this was the original sound. Lake. Lake. And then the one, the one on the left, what we've done is scaled up the formant frequencies. Lake, lake. And then on the right, we've scaled them down. Lake, lake. So because we've scaled these formant frequencies, it kind of sounds like we're listening to three different talkers. Lake, lake. So on this slide, you can see that both the formant frequencies and the fundamental frequency are both changing. And these are both of the cues that we've talked about so far. There was a study done by Christina Fuller and her colleagues in 2014 that looked at the contributions of changing fundamental frequency and vocal tract length. So vocal tract length is demonstrated on this graph on the left here. What we have are different spectral shapes, as well as the harmonics that are logarithmically scaled, filling that spectral envelope. So the green one is um, a shift away from the orange, right? We can see these these different changes in terms of the fundamental frequency because the um, harmonics are in a different place. And then in the blue graph over here, what this is is a shifting up of the formant frequencies compared to the orange one in the middle. So we can see on the blue graph that the um, harmonic frequencies are exactly in the same spot, which means the fundamental frequency is the same, but the relative amplitudes and the position of those formants is really what's being changed. So what they found um, in a study, well, let's, let's explain what they did. They changed these different parameters in a gradual fashion. So for example, they had five different fundamental frequencies and six different vocal tract lengths. And what they did is they played all the different combinations of those different morphed versions, morphed versions of the voice and just had people guess, did you listen to a man or did you listen to a woman? And so the more blue points on this graph mean that for this combination of sounds where the fundamental frequency was scaled down by 12 
and the vocal track length was increased by a factor of 3.6 semitones, that that was sufficient for someone to reliably say every time that they heard a man's voice. So if we move the fundamental frequency up to the right on this graph, you'll see that it gets less blue and gets more toward the white pinkish area. But notice there's a lot of room to go in this color scale before it's perfectly red. Um, so it didn't quite um, make that complete change into thinking that you're listening to a woman. Um, correspondingly, you know, if you changed the vocal track length to, to shift that down, um, it made it all the way, you know, to sort of like maybe the 70% more mark, but it didn't really convince uh, the listeners fully that they were listening to a woman's voice. So if you look at the rest of this chart, you'll see that if we combine both of these cues, so for example, um, shifting up the fundamental frequency and shifting down the vocal track length, now we reach the sort of fully saturated red end of this continuum. And what this graph shows us is that to convince someone that they've heard a change from a masculine voice to a feminine voice, what you need to do is shift both the source and the filter. You need to shift the fundamental frequency and the positions of the formants that define the vocal track length. It's worth it to talk about some common misperceptions about the acoustics of gender as well. So for example, it's sometimes said that women speak faster than men. There aren't a whole lot of research studies out there, but the one that I found here that was talked about in a recent textbook shows the exact opposite. They actually found that women were speaking more slowly than men. So if this is true, why should this opinion persist? Well, one idea is that if there's a greater acoustic space that the women are working within, as we saw in the vowel space diagram, and if they're speaking at the same rate, it would be perceived as having more articulatory motion, and therefore may be perceived as speaking faster. There's another thing that's commonly heard, especially in audiology clinics, by people who have high-frequency hearing loss. And they might say sometimes, I can't hear women's voices because women have higher frequencies than men. But as it turns out, if you look at the spectrum of a woman's voice, it turns out to be very similar to that of a man's voice. So what we have here are the long-term spectra of 15 women and 15 men, and the primary difference is the difference in the very first harmonic, which should make sense as that's the source of the fundamental frequency. And then after that, everything just kind of blends together, and the differences that we see here aren't necessarily the differences that you'd find uh, in a person with or without hearing loss. So there are probably some other reasons why people might have more or less difficulty listening to someone who's a woman or a man, but it doesn't seem to correspond to the average level of the frequency energy in their voice. Now another topic in gender-related voice acoustics is the idea of creaky voice or glottal fry. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this because it gives us an opportunity to leverage some of our acoustics knowledge to understand something that has actually been part of an ongoing discussion for about a decade. So what is vocal fry? What it is is irregularity in the voice periodicity that occurs when someone's producing speech at the very lowest end of their fundamental frequency range. So what we see on the, on the screen here is on the left, we have what's called modal voice. In the middle, this is breathy voice, which we'll get to in just a moment. And then on the right, what we have is creaky voice. And what you can see in the waveform, if we zoom in, is differences in the timing pattern. So because we're going to look at timing, we're not going to focus on the spectrogram so much. We can just focus right on the waveform. So on the left, we have modal voice. And what we see is regularity in the timing of those glottal pulses. Conversely, on the right, we see a very irregular pattern of where those peaks in the energy occur, including some that I'm not really even sure if we'd count in uh, in that sequence. So the primary difference we're seeing here is regularity versus irregularity of that glottal timing. If you're dipping into vocal fry like this, then what we see is some irregularity in those glottal pulses. So what I want to do now in the midst of this recorded lecture is give you some audio examples of modi uh, modal phonation uh, compared against creaky voice um, or, or vocal fry, and then play a clip from uh, Lexicon Valley, which is a podcast host by John McWhorter, which talks exactly about this issue. So here we are in Prot, and what I've called up are my pronunciations of the word yeah using modal voice and creaky voice. So here's what it sounds like. Yeah.
Yeah. So obviously there's a difference in pitch. Um, and what we want to do is think about this irregularity in timing. And one of the things you can see is that the glottal pulses are so slow and so far apart that we can see them individually on our spectrogram, which is something we don't always get to see. So here we can see a little bit of evidence in that, but they're so close together they kind of blur together uh, horizontally over time. One of the most interesting aspects of 21st century English, and it's something called vocal fry in the literature. A wonderful Vella Lavelle on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend had this so perfectly and had a line that exemplified it so perfectly that let's play her from one of the later episodes using an absolutely delicious vocal fry. She's pushing it. She's making fun of it. But actually, it's almost not caricatured in the way some people use this today. Here it is. Ha ha! She's here. God, stop. Why, why do you care? Because you have some reunion intrigue happening and I am here for it. I'm an old married lady. The romantic intrigue part of my life is over forever. You've been married for five minutes. I know, and I'm so happy, but there's no drama, and I love drama. That element of going down into the lower register and having that little bit of buzz in your speech when you want to emphasize something, that's something which, in the 21st century, women have started, and then the men start jumping into it, and it's happening very quickly. But it begins with women. It's this little change in just how it sounds to be an ordinary American speaker. And today it can be almost hard to even think of it as, to use something else from the 21st century, to think of it as a thing. And the best example of this is from the journalist, Sarah Koenig, and you can hear her going from being in her 30s to being in her 40s over the 21st century, actually developing this vocal fry manner of speaking. And there's nothing cartoonish about it in the way that Vela Lavelle was doing. It's just a different kind of tincture to the way women, and now a great many men, talk. What am I talking about? Here's the difference. Here's Sarah Koenig in the year 2000. Very ordinary report. I am in Austin, sitting in the back of George W. Bush's dusty blue Lincoln town car. He's twisting a gum wrapper around and around his finger, and he's grouchy. He's fighting the flu, I find out later. But right now, I think I must be letting him down somehow. See, that sounds to me like it reminds me of driving around in my green Honda Civic out in California in the year 2000, not knowing quite what was ever going to happen to me. That was that. Now, 2014, basically 15 years later, here's the same Sarah Koenig talking about the same sorts of things. But listen to that burr quality that there is in her voice by this point. And I'm not a detective or a private investigator. I'm not even a crime reporter. But yes, every day this year, I've tried to figure out the alibi of a 17-year-old boy. Before I get into why I've been doing this, I just want to point out something I'd never really thought about before I started working on this story. And that is, it's really hard to account for your time, in a detailed way, I mean. How'd you get to work last Wednesday, for instance? Drive? Walk? Bike? Was it raining? Are you sure? Did you go to any stores that day? If so, what did you buy? Who did you talk to? Isn't that neat? And it's not any, I don't know Sarah Koenig, but I doubt if she was thinking about that. So let's take a closer look at that one sentence from the podcast. There's no drama and I love drama. So what we're seeing here is our waveform and corresponding spectrogram and the pitch contour. And, you know, this is obviously being used for a little bit of sarcasm. <laughs> and what we can see is a number of different signatures of our creaky voice. So for example, in this part here, we can see our creaky voice. Uh, and what you want to notice is the differences in the waveform on the right side versus the left side. So on the left side, we have our typical modal voice, we can see our pitch contour in the blue here. And then notice as soon as you know, the talker kicks into her creaky voice, that pitch contour just drops right off the screen. And this should make sense because when you think about a pitch contour or fundamental frequency contour, what we're doing is we're measuring the regular rate of repetition. And if what we have is an irregular rate, there's not really any periodicity. And the fact that we have little blips of blue dots on this, on this pitch tracker means the computer is really trying hard to find a pitch there, but it's not being successful.
Here's another example of the pitch tracking being dropped out. So this is a different sentence where we have creaky voice in these specific spots, and we can see that this pitch contour, which has a pretty good dynamic range, you know, sort of between in the you know mid to mid to low 300s, ranging down toward 80. But notice in these very specific parts of the sentence that pitch contour is dropping out. So it's worth understanding this because there's been this debate over the past few years, is creaky voice a problem? And, uh, you know, because it's used to actually, you know, disparage people and make fun of their speech or just make them seem like they're not speaking correctly. And the short answer to this question is no. And the long answer is no, it's not a problem. Um, so it, as it turns out, creaky voice is used intentionally in many languages to convey linguistic meaning. So for example, in the northern variety of Vietnamese, which is a tonal language, we have six different tonal contours, which means it's a pitch contour that you add onto a word to make sure the person knows exactly which word you're saying. So for example, if you look at three words here, pretty simple syllable structure, this b and a, ah, but depending on the voice quality you use, you're saying a totally different word. So if I just say ba, um, I'm talking about the number three. If I make it breathy, like ba, then I'm talking about lady, but if I use creaky voice, I can say ba. And so what I'm doing there is saying the word for at random. And so those different voice qualities are ba, ba, ba. This difference in creaky versus breathy and modal voice isn't a difference in conveying sarcasm. It's a, con it's a difference in terms of exactly what word you're saying in the sentence. Mandarin is another tonal language, which is not, you know, particularly well known for having creakiness, but as it turns out, what you see there in blue, the third tone, dips down into the lowest point of the pitch contour um, for a person's pitch range. And so what we see increasingly is that if we measure this, we can see creak right in the center of that third tone. So when trying to aim for a particularly low fundamental frequency, of course there are anatomical constraints. There's only so high I can make my voice and only so low I can make my voice. But if I want to make it seem like I'm hitting a really low pitch, one way of doing that is to dip into creaky style of phonation. So this is a skill that's accessible by both men and women, but as it turns out, it's becoming more popular among women. Another reason why vocal fry tends to be more noticeable in women is that they started doing it first. Women tends to, tend to be the drivers of linguistic change, both for um, specific words, styles of speaking, or in this case, phonation quality. Another factor that is unfortunately true is that women also tend to be criticized for pretty much anything they do that's different than what men expect of them. So for example, when you hear typically older men complaining about women who use uh, vocal fry, sometimes what they're expressing is discomfort with the idea that women would express dominance when they would prefer them to sound more weak. Alternatively, they might just express discomfort with the idea that a woman isn't sounding that the, the way that they expect her to sound. So as you can tell, there's a lot of judgment that goes on here, and I want to both remain neutral, but also just call everyone's attention to the fact that there are some pretty unfair judgments made, uh, particularly about women when it comes to this manner of speaking. And a lot of them aren't really fair and tend to toss accusations out there that are both unscientific. And I'd say in general, based on an idea of judgment and disparagement, rather than an appreciation of language or people's individuality. So as you can tell, it can be a little difficult to remain totally neutral about this uh, topic because there tends to be a lot of unfair accusations leveled against women in particular um, that are not really based on science, but instead based on social judgments. So that's the end of the content for this class. Um, if you enjoyed this, I, I recommend that you check out some of the resources that I used in creating it. Um, the Ologies podcast by Allie Ward is really wonderful, and her episode on phonology dips into a bunch of the topics that we've talked about here. There's an NPR article and corresponding podcast episode, as well as the episode uh, that we listened to part of, um, the Lexicon Valley. And then the study that Mark Liberman did on the differences in pitch between women and men across cultures is linked down on his language log, um, linked right down, down there below.